what we're going to do today is we're going to start off, um, we want to do three things. You guys know how, um, uh, how much I like to have fun with words. So the three things that we are going to focus on doing today is celebrating, uh, evaluating, and collaborating. So we want to spend some time talking about uh, the way that God has blessed some of the peace in the past, uh, do an evaluation of where we are at the moment, and look forward um, to the future. Uh, so raise your hand if you were at Summit of Peace's very first worship service. Okay. Wait, how old were you then? No, don't. I'm just. I don't. Um, now raise your hand if you were there for the first building in '91. Okay. So uh, when we go through the history, I have a couple of gaps that I couldn't find in, in the history, so I may ask you to uh, help fill them in a little bit. But uh, for the most part, I think we've got an accurate uh, reflection. So we're going to start on that. We're going to talk a little bit about the past. I know that um, um, lots of people, that we have people who, so the, the far extreme is uh, we have people, hey, they're at the same table, people who uh, have been here from the beginning and people who just joined us, right? So we've got the whole spectrum of people, um, and we want to make sure we're all on the same page to jump off. So starting off, I want to talk to you about um, the background here at Summit of Peace. Uh, if you are unaware, but back in 1984, uh, the district, uh, including the mission officer, decided to commission a study of what uh, is this part of Thornton to discover if it would have the uh, potential uh, for a church. Um, that research led them to believe in conversations with the, the nearest Lutheran church at the moment, which was uh, Gethsemane Lutheran in North Glen, that a preaching station would be uh, appropriate. You see there how I say pre preaching station, show a photo? Yeah, I, I can't find one. So um, if anybody has one, I'd love to have it for uh, future generations, but in the moment. Um, they started off on October 4th, 1984, as a preaching station. Um, the, uh, not uh, too long after that, nine months or so after that, they uh, contacted a retired pastor by the name of uh, Reverend Kuyper. He had uh, most recently served uh, St. Andrews in uh, Mount Bello, I believe. And um, if I recall correctly, he'd been in the district for quite a while, served a number, number of places. And he had recently retired and uh, was approached to, um, to uh, lead the effort um, uh, with folks mainly from Gethsemane who lived out in this area. Many of them uh, went around uh, knocking on doors, talking to people, saying, Hey, want to be a Lutheran? And, and lots of people said, what's a Lutheran? <laughs> right? Right. But their efforts uh, bore much fruit. And uh, uh, in October 6th of 1985, they held their very first uh, worship service at Tarver Elementary. Um, and they found an organist to play. In fact, if I recall the story correctly, the organist's mother volunteered her to play. Is that correct? Yep. And uh, so they were, they were able to uh, launch uh, and, uh, and begin having worship services. In February of 86, they decided to change the name to Summit of Peace Lutheran Church. Let's consider this a trivia question. What was its name? Summit Grove. That's correct. Yeah, it was Summit Grove. And uh, they changed the name to Summit of Peace Lutheran Church. Technically, Summit of Peace Evangelical Lutheran Church, but... Um, Nobody knows what a Lutheran is, so you certainly can't say uh, Lutheran evangelical. So, um, The Charter Sunday was actually April 27th, 1986. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with what a Charter Sunday is, that's the, first, that's the Sunday where you are uh, officially uh, welcomed into uh, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, as an actual congregation. It requires that you have a constitution, bylaws, all those sorts of things. Uh, district president was out, I imagine or one of his reps, uh, to, do the, to do the charter. Um, it sounds very similar to when you install a pastor, uh, but it, they ask it of the, the congregation, uh, that which they will be faithful to and that sort of thing. And they kicked off on their very first charter Sunday with 56 confirmed and 65 baptized members. Um, in December of 1986... Uh, they began working and purchased the 3.25 acres that you find us on now. Actually, there's been a little bit of a land swap, but for our purposes, um, they actually secured the land here um, to, to begin looking forward to having a permanent place here. 
Then in June of 1987, uh, Pastor Kuiper re-retired. No pastors actually really ever retire. They're always roped into something. But he re-retired, and the congregation began making plans to call from the seminary. Uh, in August of that year, they received a call from the seminary. Reverend Ashenbrenner, he was installed um, in August, August 30th, 1987, and he served till September 1989. And if I understand correctly, he entered the um, Air Force as a chaplain, decided that's where God was leading, leading him, if I, if I understand the story correctly. Uh, after that, the, the congregation went through the call process. Um, in any of the history I found, I, don't, I didn't see exactly how long it took, but I did find the next thing was that Pastor All's house uh, accepted the call in May of 1990. And uh, quite impressive, i got to tell you, to uh, accept a call for a church that doesn't even have a building or anything like that. But he believed in the potential not only of uh, the area, but especially of God's people. And in July of that year, they broke ground on the first building. Now, if you weren't around for the, the early years of Summit of Peace, then maybe you don't know uh, just how amazing and astounding um, God blessed uh, the efforts of the people here and his word. Um, according to the Rocky Mountain District, Summit of Peace still to this day remains one of the fastest uh, church plants in the Rocky Mountain District history. Uh, it remains one of the fastest to be self-sustaining, which means uh, support, uh, being able to support itself rather than support from a mother church uh, or from the district. Um, these are our, our three, the next three stats that just kind of blow my mind. They had over 100 in worship after four years. They had over 200 in worship after eight years. And they had over 300 in worship after 16 years. That's quite an astounding, uh, astounding feat and um, a an amazing testimony, as I mentioned, to God's people, to the faithfulness of, uh, of Pastor All's house primarily during that period, uh, and the gifts that he had to uh, connect with people, connect with the neighborhood, connect with the community. Um, I want to show you this next slide. This is um, in a voters meeting maybe a year or so ago in some other context. I've, I've shown some of the pieces of growth all the way back to 2004, because that's what was available on the Missouri Synod's website. But I put Rhonda to work, crawling through dusty crawl spaces and such to find the records for every single year of Summit's existence. We only could find it to 86, so we're not sure exactly what the record was for 87, um, at least in terms of statistical reports. So we're going to. Um, so I, I wanted to take us back that entire time and have you guys take a look at a couple things. So number one, this is its growth of its uh, baptized membership. So if you are unfamiliar with the designation, the difference between baptized and confirmed membership, um, then you probably haven't been confirmed. <clears throat> uh, but in essence, your baptized membership is everybody in the church, all the way down to the, to the two brand new ones that were baptized members today, right? Um, the next uh, designation we usually follow is your confirmed membership. These are then your adults, people who have been confirmed in the faith. Uh, one of the, the best things to look for in terms of health of the congregation is the bigger that gap is, the better, right? Because what does it mean? Yep, you got a younger, uh, a younger church. Sometimes those lines are the same lines in the Missouri Synod. So um, some of the piece, very, very blessed early on. Um, the next one I want to show you is the average worship attendance. So this is its uh, average worship attendance. You see that uh, um, it's... Uh, its growth was quite rapid at the beginning, but in the late 90s um, started to have a little bit of a plateau. Um, so I, this is something that um, ever since I've been a pastor here at Summit of Peace has intrigued me uh, that I have wondered about because in my opinion, um, I, I hear this from, from people who came from the, the church plant with us, from new people every single time I meet with them. Summit of Peace is indeed one of the, the friendliest churches that you'll ever come across. Uh, it has a fantastic location. It has committed people. It has, I believe, really full and engaging and faithful worship. Lots and lots of things going for it. So I've kind of wondered over the years um, uh, what might be going on, why Summit of Peace might be, might be plateauing a little bit in worship. And, and I want to um, show you a couple other things to get you thinking about it. So you see there uh, on this graph, there are um, three. There's three numbers there. 
You're about to get a pie chart, and you're going to guess for me ahead of time. This is worship attendance in America. So in other words, the average church, how many people do they worship in a given week? And I would like you to guess for me the percentage of churches in America that worship 100 a week or less. 90? 80? Wow, you guys are really pessimistic. I um, it's 50. Uh, half the churches in America worship uh, 100 or less uh, during the week. The, the next um, spot there is 101 to 350. What would be your guess for this size? 35, 20, 40. It's 40%. Who said 40? You get the door prize. All right. So it's 40%. So um, just stop and think about this for a second. What that means is that 90% of all churches in the United States worship at right around what Summit does or less. There are only 10% of churches that worship more than that. Now, is anybody curious how this compares to the Missouri Synod? Because I am. Thank you for... She's my straight man today. So I'm going to ask you the same things, except I already gave one away. Good job. Good guess. In the Missouri Synod, our average uh, churches that worship 100 or less are 45, so pretty close. What do you think the next number is? It's 45 again. Yep. So um, what does that leave, all you math majors? 10%. So what this means is, for all intents and purposes, the Missouri Synod really, really reflects the rest of uh, the country in terms of its worship. So as I mentioned, um, uh, this is something that, that intrigues me and was hard for me to um, put a finger on. I can tell you before coming to Summit of Peace, one of the things I always wondered about was um, what you would call retention of members, right? So in other words, how serious was a church about making sure that its current members stayed uh, active and engaged. And when I come to some of the piece, I'll tell you that one of the things that impressed me absolutely the most about Pastor All's house was his dedication to this, right? Uh, how, how much he paid attention to, um, had, a, had a pretty uh, formal way of keeping track, but once you missed three uh, Sundays in a row, you usually would, would hear from him. Anybody ever get one of those? Yeah, lots of people, right? <clears throat> And so, and so he did a fantastic job uh, of what we would call retention, making, making people stay engaged. And so it puzzled me to discover um, these numbers that, we already, that I already uh, put up there. For, let me look at them again. Because in my uh, estimation, and really what I was taught in seminary, is that, that to prevent that, that gap that grew, the disengagement we'd call that, um, was to do exactly what Pastor All's house did. But um, the numbers here would suggest that that only worked for so long. So what this did was this led me um, uh, to become a, I don't even know what you want to call it, a, um, a, a, a church detective. So um, I've, been going, I've been a pastor going on almost 20 years serving in the church in one capacity or another. And I sat down and thought about all of the pastors that I knew who had been at a church that was this size and had led them past it. And I decided to interview them. So um, that took place with me going around and talking to 13 different pastors uh, who had been at their churches long enough to lead them through a plateau like this and ask them, what did they do? What did it take? Um, now this interview, I want you to understand, uh, was everything from, say, a couple of days uh, with pastors that I know really, really well, and some of them who I hardly uh, knew at all, and they talked to me for maybe 30 minutes. But um, the point being that I, I spent some time um, talking to them, and over the course of it, I discovered that um, none of them really had contradictory things to say, but they all had three, three things in common from their perspective um, that, that caused a church to plateau. And the number one there was leadership style. And what they meant by that was that the t style of leadership that it takes to plant a church and to help it grow to its first size or to lead it to the next size or to lead it to the next size, those are all different skills, not the same skills, right? 
Um, so their theory was that it took different skills the more that your church grew. Now, thinking back to the chart I showed you before, that 90% of all LCMS churches are 350 or smaller in worship. Guess what kind of education you get at the seminary. What size church you're taught to lead. 350 or less. And, and that's not a criticism of them, right? I mean, that's, that's, who, their, that's who their base is, right? But, but these pastors, as I began to talk to them, said that uh, you know, the, the, the training, the understanding they got helped them immensely to grow their churches to that size, but was inadequate when it came to leading them to leading them past that point. Um, the, num the next one was organizational structure, and by this they meant how their church was organized and, and did business. And this is everything from your, your polity um, to how you handle um, staff, who makes decisions, things like that. All 13 of these churches and pastors that I interviewed started with a constitution like Summit of Peace, which was constitution and bylaws. None of them still have that today. They've all changed their, their structure as they grew. We'll talk about the whys of that when we, we get there. And the third one that is sort of the most tenuous or hardest to grasp is this idea and concept of increasing complexity. Um, it's sort of like the, the illustration that I, I thought of, none of them... I never asked him if any of this was right, but did anybody grow up in a really, really big family, like five, six, something like that, that kind of kids? Um, so if, you, if you're raising your hand right now, tell me which end of the spectrum you're on, the, the, the top, the, the older or the younger? Older? So, and some younger? Okay, if you were an older, if you were at the top end, raise your hand. How many of you at ever any point in your life complained to your parents that they raised the younger ones differently than they raised... The older ones. You know, you don't. But I would suggest to you the larger the family gets, the greater the difference. And, that's, and that just makes sense, right? Uh, a lot of people I talk to who are in families like that mention that their older siblings served as oftentimes mom or dad for the very youngest, right? So, so a family changes the way... Um, uh, things behave, and then the more they're added, the more it changes, right? So this is a, a we'd call this like an exponential change rather than addition, addition type of change. Um, having said all of that, the most helpful of all were a number of pastors who said, you need to go study leadership and church size dynamics. And I said, what? What is, what is leadership and church size dynamics? Um, I want to talk to you about that a bit. First, let me tell you what it is not. Leadership and church size dynamics is not about church growth. Uh, it is not merely about numbers for numbers sake. So in other words, it's not simply about can we grow as fast as we possibly can, add as many people as we can, that sort of thing. And the truth of the matter is that the... Um, the plateau here at Summit and the, the puzzle that I was trying to work out, um, this is probably not the only way to, under, to, to solve this problem. Um, and, and I want to say that up front. However, this is the way I would think about it. What we are talking about today and what I'm going to share with you is not a theological or a biblical discussion. I'm not, for the most part, going to make an argument from Scripture about where we should go. Um, instead, I would like to have you think about it this way. We understand as Lutherans that God uses other, what we call first article gifts, to inform and help us, even as a church, right? Just as he does individuals. So, for example, even though we obviously believe that, that God is sovereign and does whatever he can and heals people, he most often heals them through doctors, nurses, uses people, uses medicine, uses technology. The same thing when we think of counseling, right? Um, we consider counseling psychology and those sorts of things to be at the service of, uh, of, of the church, right, to help people, but they don't ever take the place of what Scripture has to say. And what I'm going to share with you today is, in essence, a sociological way of thinking about the way groups work. Because on the one hand, um, a church is different from any other human organization in the world, right? I mean, they're led by the, the Holy Spirit and, and the power of Christ living in his people. And we have examples, including this church, of amazing and astounding things that he has done. 
But I would also suggest to you that they still operate under um, some sort of principles, uh, the way the groups work together, that sort of thing. And I'll say this up front. I absolutely believe God can violate those anytime he wants, right? Any of the things I'm going to tell you today, any of the principles of size dynamics that I'm going to share with you today, God can do whatever he wants. He can violate those at any moment. But I do think it's helpful for us to think about a church as a social organization in order to, to tackle um, that which lies before us. So one way to think about it is size dynamics is a way to understand how the church operates as a group. Uh, for example, as a team, as a company, as a school, as any other organization. If you've ever been part of, say, like a business that started from scratch, uh, maybe you started one yourself and it grew quite large, um, the most successful businesses are ones that are able to actually change and adapt as they grow. What the first person who started the company does with his hours is vastly different than what the CEO does once it's a thousand people or whatever, right? Same thing with, um, if you think of teams or um, schools, any of those sorts of things. The more that a school grows, the more not only do they add teachers, but eventually then they need a principal, right? So what we're talking about here is in essence that. And there are many, many, many different books and studies um, on this topic. I am going to share with you, when you are done, you may take, I've printed out for you, um, the most helpful article that summarizes this concept. So you, if you want to learn more about it, you can. And on the back of it, there's a bibliography of other books to read. The, um, all the, these people who study size dynamics for churches uh, sort of skin the cat differently. And so I want to tell you up front what we're talking about. Some, church, some of these studies base it on the giving in the church. Some of it base it on its membership. Some of it base it on its weekly worship. Right? These are all different numbers that you could track and, and look at and think about when it comes to size. We're talking about weekly worship, right? So just so that you know from here on out, um, there's two cases, in fact, when I'll point out that we're not. But for the most part, we're talking about, about weekly worship um, with what I want to share to you. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that like everything in life, uh, size has its own culture. And this can be true of the Boy Scouts, this can be true of Kiwanis, this can be true of any group that you've ever joined, and also equally true of the church. Is that people tend to prefer a certain size and then believe that their preference is best. We're, we tend to all as humans be like that, right? Whatever we like is correct. I want to make sure you hear what I say um, right now before we go forward, and that is this, that no size is bi biblical. We're going to talk a lot the rest of the time about the difference that it takes for a church to grow from a small to a larger church. But I do not want you to hear in anything that I'm saying that that means a large church is better than a small church, right? Because that's not true. Um, in fact, it takes all sizes. I think God uh, intends us to work um, uh, in, in all the different ways and gifts that we have, right? The, the small rural church and all the things that it does and is able to do well um, are great gifts to God and his church, and so are the larger churches. So the goal is not to simply talk about how do we make some of peace larger. That's not the goal. The goal is to recognize and say, do we have um, things that perhaps we are unaware, behaviors, policies, things set in place that perhaps limit our being able to care for all the people that we have? Right? Back to that, that gap between membership and attendance. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you the principles of size dynamics. These are just overarching principles about size dynamics and how they work in an organization. And then we're going to go through and talk about the size church, that's the, all of them that Summit have been in. And then we're going to talk at the end about what I believe is necessary for us if we're going to approach the next, uh, the next size. Um, so principles of size dynamics. I want to give you an, what I would call uh, an example, in other words. right? Some of these are not, uh, are, are not totally obvious, and some of them make sense when you hear them, and others are, are, are totally obvious, like this one. So, for example, every organization, every church, recognizes that at some point, um, every going congregation will add staff, Right? And they do it at varying degrees. So um, this is one where you guys could help me out a little bit. I, I've got the chart back up. And if I understand correctly, Pastor Hodel started happening, started happening, started helping 
2001, 2002, is this correct-ish, you think? I couldn't find an exact year. Um, and then I, I know Pastor Betcher was here, because I used to go to circuit meetings and see him, but I couldn't find anywhere that told me the exact year. So he's missing from the middle of this. Um, uh, and then, of course, Pastor Hoffensberger was called in 2006, I believe, six or seven. Six, yeah, so I have it right there. Now, that's just clergy staff. We could back up way back here and say after Pastor Allshouse was called, I think the next position was part-time secretary eventually, right? Um, and then eventually full-time or close to. Um, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Ken was our first paid um, custodial work, right? So, so we've, added, we've added staff along the way as we grow. So this, and that's one that makes sense to everybody, right? You get bigger, these are things uh, that you have to do. Um, but the other ones might not seem so, so uh, obvious. Um, I, I want to give these to you as principles, but I don't want to spend tons and tons of time uh, on them. These are, these are all covered in the handout if you want to take those. Um, but they are helpful for us to understand what we're talking about. So the larger a church gets, the more... Um, its complexity increases. And what that means is the, the larger the church, the less the members have in common. So it requires some different behaviors. So for example, a church of 400 typically needs four to five times the programs of a 200, uh, a church that worships 200 a week, not two times, right? So this is what I'm talking about with exponential change, right? Um, a couple other things. Staff is usually added for every 150 to 200 people. This is, the, this is what they teach in the Missouri Synod absolute textbook, right? One, one pastor can serve about that many people. But according to size dynamics, you'll eventually reach a tipping point where you actually need more than that. You need it more often, 75 to 100. And that tipping point is usually about 1,000 in worship, right? So if you think about maybe LCMS churches that you know, or not even the ones who have these huge staffs, right? Think about how many they worship on a Sunday, and that will explain that a little bit. And another one is a, a, the shifting role of people involved in the church between the, the laity and the staff. In a small church, policy is divided, decided by many, and ministry is done by the few, right? Think about uh, summits, constitution, bylaws early on, and, and basically the, te the, the template that the district gives you basically is a, a um, council and board structure, right? And the idea and concept as, in essence is that the, the council and the boards will approve of the ministry that the pastor will do, right? But especially the smaller the church, the more he's able to do all those things. But as the church grows, uh, the ministry is done by many, but the decisions are made by less and less people. Um, this is a, a, one of the, the complexity things that a lot of people, uh, if they grew up in a smaller church, are not fond of. But the truth of the matter is if the larger you get, the more you, if you believe you have to decide everything by consensus, what will happen eventually? Nothing, yeah. So <clears throat> um, another one is the increasing intentionality. Assimilation becomes really important. So in other words, how you get people in and connected to your church Right? becomes more and more important uh, because there's more and more people. My favorite, um, I know, wait, where's Homer around here somewhere? I'm going to pick on, on Homer. Hey, there's Homer. Homer's my favorite person because he has like three or four stories about how he would, he would go to a different service. He'd go to the wrong service, and he would say to someone, oh, are you new here? And they'd be like, no, I'm a charter member. <laughs> right? He, he's told me that story, right? But to his credit, he was never afraid of sticking his foot in his mouth, but we all know that, right? Yeah, but, but, but that's what happens, right? You, the, the larger you get, um, the, the less likely everyone's going to have these things in common, and so you, you get them connected. Here's one that you might not realize is actually true. The larger your church, the harder it is to get volunteers. Does that surprise you? That's one of them. One of them is there's always people to do it, but the other is this. It's more likely that someone you don't know well is going to recruit you in a large church. But then you guys all guessed the other one, which is, it feels like there's lots of people, so they don't need me, right? Uh, another thing that's necessary is better communication. So the larger a church becomes, the more likely you are to hear someone say, I didn't know about that, right? Because there's more and more going on. This is one, an interesting one. Uh, another is um, an increasing quality of production. Let me tell you what I mean by that. 
So the smaller a church is, the more its worship is horizontal. And what I mean by that is when a church is small, and, and having planted a church, I know this, you very early, your worship is very much corporate. It's about the people who are there with you, right? It's very relational. You know everyone. You know what they're going through, and it makes the worship great, but, but also very, very horizontal. Some other examples of things are, are that you are really tolerant of um, the people who donate their time to sing or do things like that, right? Because you have a relationship with them. It, you're like a parent now, so you see their performance or their gifts to the church through kind of rose-colored glasses, right? I love that guy. He, he'd do anything for me. I don't care if he messed up a note, right? Or um, this happens a little bit even with the pastors, the smaller the church is, right? Well, I can put up with his sermons because he was with me when Grandma died, right? But the larger a church becomes, the less people would actually know one another, right? And so as an example, this is just one, but as an example, so the music, if it is only mediocre, would detract. Because for those people, there is no relationship going on. Does that make sense? Their, their reaction to it is, is what I would call vertical, right? So this is why you'll see the larger and larger churches, the more they become a production. Now, don't hear me say that that's a goal or a good thing. This is just a recognition of, of what tends to take place when you get larger. Um, flexibility. Uh, the larger the church, the more stuff going on means the more things that can change, right? So in other words, to say it, if you have a small church where you only have Sunday worship, uh, Sunday school, and confirmation during the week, there's not a lot of things that, that can change. And so um, the larger a church goes, they might start a ministry, goes for a while, runs its course, they stop it, they start a new one. They add a service, they take away a service, they do all, all kinds of things because of how large they are. So the larger a church, usually the more flexible it needs to be. Um, the shifting role of the pastors also uh, becomes true. The smaller a church, the more the pastor is available for anything, right? Um, I can remember this both at uh, my, my small rural parish in Nebraska. Um, when, when it snowed and we were going to have church, guess who was shoveling the sidewalk out front? Yep, that was me. Um, uh, when we planted a church, uh, guess who set up for Sunday school every single Sunday? That was, oh, no, that wasn't me. That was Julie. <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean. Huh? You, right, of course, of course. So um, the smaller the church, the more common it is and correct for the pastor to be available to do, to do anything. And this is especially where, as I said in the last or two slides ago, where you get the... Um, we can put up with the pastor's preaching because he's a good pastor, right? We know him. He's there for all of our things. And so we can, we, he, he, he appears to be a better preacher than maybe other people would think, right? Um, but the larger you get, preaching and pastoring are sufficient skills in smaller churches, but leadership is needed for larger ones. And you often see uh, staff moving from being generalists to specialists, Right? And you can think about it even in your, your context, right? Pastor All's house was the pastor, but when you got another one, even part-time, what did you ask him to do? Youth, right? You, you asked him to specialize. Does that make sense? Um, and so it also means that the larger your church grows, um, the smaller the span of pastoral care. So what I mean by this, as, uh, and I mentioned it earlier, that the, the understanding both um, among not only clergy, but this tends to be true of psychologists, doctors, and their practices, things like that, they tend to really only be able to serve 50 to 200 people well. And after that, it, it, their, bra their bandwidth is not big enough. Does that make sense? They don't, have, they don't have the time, the hours, the emotional capacity. This tends to be the, the, the cutoff point for people. Um, but they're trained for it. Right. Um, in churches where they use things like, uh, you know, other people to do work and ministry for them that the pastors train, these are lay people and they don't have eight years of training. So their their bandwidth is smaller. Does that make sense? So in our context, Stephen's ministry. Right. We wouldn't ask them to serve near as many people as we would the pastors, but we also won't send them to the same ones that we do. We recognize we're going to get the the the. I don't know what to say. Most critical? Does that make, does that make sense? Um, 
And finally, the last one. I know you guys are saying, when is the last one, please? Um, the larger the church, the more it needs to concentrate on doing a few things well. So even though they have lots of, let's say, uh, child and youth programs, that's one of their main focuses, right? We do kid stuff great, right? And they might have lots of ministries, but that's one of their focus. And another is worship. Just to give you an example, uh, Bethlehem Lutheran and Lakewood is one of our largest LCMS churches. And when you look at them, they only do three things. Worship, their small groups, and the school. That's it. Right? Those are the three areas of ministry. That's all they do. Now, there's lots of things that fall into that, but um, nonetheless. The larger the church, the more important a distinctive vision becomes. So in other words, a more, the more important it becomes to say, this is where we're going. This is what God has asked us to do. Because in, in the real world, no one ever, for the most part, has like a bad idea. Right? Someone comes to me and says, Pastor, I think we should help these people. And who's going to say, well, that's a terrible idea. We shouldn't help someone, right? No one's going to say that. But the question becomes, you, you can't help everybody. So how will you as a group decide this is a ministry we will focus on, this isn't, that sort of thing. And their, their vision that they've agreed on becomes more important. Uh, the larger the church, the more it develops its own mission outreach rather than supporting existing ones. Um, this happens for a lot of reasons. One is because the dollars get bigger and bigger and bigger, and people want to see that they're actually used correctly and not, not wasted, that sort of thing. Lots of things tie into this, but the larger church gets, the more you tend to see that. And finally, the leaders in the church. Uh, when a church is small, leadership is usually um, given to people who are eligible, and that's a lot of times based on tenure, right? How long have they they've been along, around? The larger a church gets, um, the more that those who are leading have to have a common vision and philosophy. If you guys were around uh, during our call process, um, I told you when we had our three candidates before us that speaking to them, I believed all three of them were, they and I were completely aligned on vision and philosophy. And to me, that was the most important thing. We could work out skills, everything else after that. But I did not want a partner where we were continually fighting about should we do this or that or that's theologically wrong or you have to have a praise band or you have to have incense or any, I didn't want to fight any over any of that stuff, right? I wanted us to believe philosophically the same thing and everything else we could work out. And that tends to be the same with your leaders. You have to all be saying yes and agree. That's where we want to go. And then you can work out all the, the other stuff. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the different stages. There's actually many different stages, but... There's no point in us talking about ones that are way, way down the road past us. I'm only going to talk about the two we've been through and the one that we're in. Okay? So the first one, the first size church, when you talk about church dynamics, is um, 3 to 40. They actually usually say um, 1 to 40, but last time I checked, Jesus said when there's two or three gathered. So I'm going to say... I'm going to say three. You've got to have three, and we'll, we'll say you're a church. So three to 40 is considered a, a house church. Um, the character of a house church, the things that people will find about it, is that it's highly relational, that it is highly democratic, and the pastor is a true shepherd there, right? He's there for every single, every single aspect of your life. Um, its growth happens relationally. In other words, word of mouth. You invite someone, you talk to them, you tell them about it, you go because you're friends with, with this person. It happens all relationally, right? When you're this size, there's no evangelism committee, there's no, you don't have big programs, things like that. It grows, it grows naturally and organically. Um, in order to cross the threshold, it has to do a couple things. It either has to birth a new house church or it has to go to the next size. And in order to do that, it has to accept that there will be some loss of intimacy and spontaneity in order to grow. Now, what I find interesting about this is, and so um, my folks who raised their hand early on, I know that at your charter worship service, you had 56 people. You guys technically started larger than this, this size. But I would guess the preaching station, the, you know, the previous couple of years was smaller than that, right? I mean, I don't know. How, what was the first number you remember that you started out with? What? 25-ish? Sound right? Okay. So, so right in the middle of this. And, and, and just tell me, just, does this sound exactly what, what it was like? Highly relational, highly democratic, right? That you connected and grew 
um, by the relationships you had with people and the community, right? So, um, so some of the peace still started in here, but technically as a church, as a charter, it actually uh, started larger than that. The next church is called a, a small church. And uh, this is a church size where you are 40 to 200 in worship on a, during the week. And there are um, some characteristics that, they, that this has. At this size, there's still the expectation that every member know each other. Uh, here, the pastor still operates as a shepherd, right? That, that 200 falls within his bandwidth, his ability to, to, um, to, do, to, to have a relationship with each and every one of them. Um, in, in a church this size, usually change only happens if you get the informal leaders to agree. And what I mean by that is you've got elected leadership, right? But there's also people know who, who everybody goes and asks whether or not they're in an elected position, right? Do such and such a people believe in this, right? And so things will only happen if those people, those people agree with it. Its growth happens still through relationships, but of all, and this might surprise you, until you get into really, really large churches, this is the size that grows best with a dynamic and charismatic pastor. What does that sound like? All right. So in order to cross the threshold, in order for, to break that 200 barrier, the idea and theory behind size dynamics suggests that you have to change in some of the six areas I'm about to tell you. Some, not all, some. One is you have to add multiplication options. Two, you have to add staff. Three, change your structure. We're going to go through these individually, so don't, don't panic. Uh, four, awesome assimilation communication. Five, a change in leadership style. And six, new facilities. So I want you to think about those of you who were around in particular about this first one. Multiplication options such as adding a Sunday service. According to size dynamics, this 200 barrier is one of the most common that churches experience. And they find it very, very difficult to break 200 in worship until they do one thing. Do you, does anybody want to guess what it is? Add a second service. In 1994, Summit of Peace did guess what? Added a second service. What did it do the next year? Broke 200 in worship. Right? So in this case, um, very, very textbook about the, um, the worship plateau. Um, heading back to our options. So multiplication options such as multiple services. Sometimes it's a small group ministry. Sometimes it's multiple Sunday morning Bible classes. Um, I know that um, even for myself, I mean, I... I guess I have an ego. I like a big crowd. You know, I, have, I like having a large Sunday morning Bible study, right? But the truth of the matter is that oftentimes in order to grow, uh, you have to expand what you're, what you're offering. Not everybody wants to hear about Acts for five months. <laughs> Number two, add clergy. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, a full-time minister can serve 150 to 200 members. So here's one place where it's different. We've been talking worship attendance. Now I'm saying to you members. They can serve 150 to 200 members uh, effectively. Um, sometimes it requires a structure change. This got me to thinking, about, again, about uh, Summit's history and the fact that in July of 08, are we correct? Uh, you guys went through a structure change. And basically what you recognized in your action behaviors was we have some things that are holding us back, right? We need to change. And I don't think the Constitution changed much. I think it was mostly bylaws, correct? Yeah, changed the bylaws, but it changed how you operated and, um, and went about things. All right, this slide actually goes back with number two. We talked about this a little bit, but the times that they added clergy, right? 2002-ish uh, and 2006, and then Pastor Betcher was there uh, in the middle as well. Now, um, just for the sake of our, our um, understanding, right, the church grew astronomically during under Bill's leadership. And I would suggest to you that because of his personality, his, uh, I mean, I've never seen anybody who did visitation like he does, right? Just absolutely astounding that he actually took the church farther than it should have. In other words, he waited longer to add staff than he probably, I don't want to should is not what I meant to say. Uh, that normally one would. Now, um, what I would say, though, about that is 
um, the the size dynamics would suggest um, that he waited too long, right? I mean, that would be be its opinion. Now, in talking to him, he said to me this many many times um, that in his opinion. Um, I think in the context we were talking about risen savior because both churches started about the same time. He said that, that he and Cameron di differed fi philosophically. Uh, Pastor Allshouse believed in getting the building first, later on the staff, and Pastor Cameron was the opposite. Get the staff, later on the building. It just shows how, how different pastors are, are different. But, um, but Summit still uh, began to add staff at a couple of different times. Um, the church also needs to become great at assimilation and communication. The church might need a leadership style change, and it also might need new facilities. Hey, let's talk about that. When did Summit get facilities? So one, it broke ground in 90 and finished in 91. The expansion was in 03, and in the history, the verbal history that is written down for me, I can't find the year of the expansion in between. Not not one, just these two. Oh, okay, I thought they added on to. Uh, we did it in oh, in phases. Maybe that's what I was. Thinking. Oh, okay, okay, and that was all here. Okay, okay, okay. See, I've always misunderstood that, and that explains. All right, so I did find them all. Good for me. <laughs> all right, um, so adding the facilities. Um, and, and so if you look at that quickly, uh, Summit did at least three-ish of those six changes that had to take place, and they broke through the 200 barrier, correct? The medium church is where Summit is currently at the moment. Now we get into the, to the heart of the matter, the meat of it. Uh, Summit of Peace currently worships right around 300 in worship, and it has for, for quite a while. It actually, for two years, 2002 and 2003, broke 300 right after the building was done, um, but went down and has never, it's never crossed 300 again since. Um, but in this size church, its character is number one, circle of belonging, and is affinity class or program. So this is the size at which you begin to say, I go to that church because of the great music ministry. I am part of that church because I love Tuesday morning Bible study, right? I go to that church because the associate pastor preaches better than the senior, whatever the thing is, right? I go because they take the youth to the National Youth Gathering every three years, whatever. But whatever, you understand what I'm saying, right? The affinity is it begins to connect people. Uh, the officers begin to do more of the ministry in partnership with the staff. When you originally put together a, a bylaws and constitution, lots of times the church views that much more as those are the people who approve a ministry than participate in it. But as the church grows, the more they, they actually participate in it. However, it also um, reaches a, a point where um, the, there's a steep learning curve for each of those. And we're going to talk about that, that in a moment. Uh, now, this is the point where pastor becomes a rancher, more than a shepherd. Do you like my... So, in other words, he is helping people do ministry than as much doing it directly. Does that make sense? And we're going to talk about this in detail. I'm just giving you the, the quick... It's growth happens a number of different ways. Through multiple options, classes, groups, services, or ministries, and through high-quality worship classes and etc. So, now I want to talk to you specifically about our context. You may, looking at this, hopefully have some light bulbs come on and say, that explains why Summit of Peace has been doing fill in the blank. And we're going to talk about all of the things that we've done over the last couple of years um, looking towards this. Oh, I forgot this at the very beginning. So, this process is actually one that, has be that began over four years ago. When Dirk first came on as president, he and I began having this discussion talking about how all this would work, researching all these sorts of things, reading the books on it, and then Seth uh, took over as well. Would you sit down? You have to stand the whole time. <laughs> um, and, and so this has been going on quite a while. The elders have been operating with this for a good 18 months. And so it explains some of the things that we're doing. The purpose of this meeting, now you finally know with one hour to go. I mean, one hour gone, half an hour left, is this. 
We believe that we have taken all the steps to cross these thresholds to better serve our, our people and address this gap that takes place between our, our current Sunday worship and the number of members we have. We have addressed and done all the changes that we can do um, without your blessing. Um, and most of them, we think, are there. There's, there's no controversy around them. Does that make sense, right? Uh, that no one's going to say, stop having small groups or stop making worship better, right? No one's, we don't think, is going to, to say those things. The ones that remain, we believe we need your buy-in buy in both formally and informally. So I want to talk to you now about those. But before I do, let me give you another chance for any questions. Okay, so let me remind you of those six things. Number one, multiplication options. Number two, staff. Hey, that one's crossed off. Guess why? We consider that done. That doesn't need to be, there's nothing left to do there. Structure change is still there. Assimilation and communication is there. A change in leadership style. And the last one is new facilities. And guess what? That one's crossed off as well. So let's talk about multiplication options. Um, as our church has grown, there, the thing that many of you have described, which is the sense of family, um, and I believe is one of the best things about Summit Peace, one of its absolute and truest gifts, becomes harder to happen naturally, right? When, when a church was a certain size, a smaller size, it was easier to say, hey, that person's, especially when you had one service, to say, those people are new, let's grab them and never let them go, Right? Now it's a little bit harder unless you're Homer and you don't care if you, if you ask the pretzers if they're new visitors today. <clears throat> right? But, but otherwise, it's a, little bit more, it's a little bit more difficult. And so it becomes uh, something you have to, to try to do. And Summit, I believe, has already done that, right? This is, in essence, I, I mean, I can't say this is why, but I would, this is one thing that it accomplishes, the dinners for eight. The dinners for eight that, 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 that used to run. Um, those become less effective when only members sign up with existing members, right? So, um, so this, this idea of multiplication options, and it means that we've done a couple of, couple of things that should stand out to you. Number one is small groups. We believe absolutely that this will be the way that we are able to maintain that family feel and connection is if you participate in our small group ministry. We think it's going to serve you in a number of different ways. One, it's going to help you to grow through the study of God's word. But two, it's going to give you a, a group that was going to care, it's going to notice when you're missing, is going to be able to tell us and help us better know, uh, hey, they're in the hospital, what's going on with them. The truth of the matter is, which would you rather have? A group of friends who love you who call and say, hey, we missed you this week, can we help you make it next week? Or do you want me to call and give you a guilt trip about it, right? Um, and then also for assimilation, right? If we have a, an existing group that's got a nice mix of members and brand new members who have just joined, then this is a way for them to assimilate and to give you, open up, pull back the veil so you understand. We have deliberately set up now our schedule where every time a new member class ends, small groups start within a month so they can sign up immediately, right? And we're deliberately on that cycle so that as soon as they finish, we can now immediately, so we don't say, well, can you wait three months to join a small group? But no, so they can join in immediately. So small groups is one of those. Another is alternate worship. All right, before everybody starts freaking out, <laughs> the elders and I believe that in order to bridge that gap, for one, to help our, our people who can't and don't worship regularly, uh, an alternative style and time may be necessary. So what we've decided to do is to create a survey, which you should expect this summer, uh, asking you your opinions about this to get a, a feel and a range and idea of what, what you think would be helpful. But the goal, to be completely honest, is to not get anybody in this room. And do you know why? You already go to church regularly. Right? So the question that we're going to be asking is how can we help people who don't go regularly? Are people who work on Sundays or uh, are weekend warriors who are skiing or the parents who are stuck doing baseball tournaments for two days, right? Is there another time when we could help, right? So multiplying options, does that make sense? And are you, you're not going to freak out yet until you know more? I didn't actually hear anybody say, agree to that yet. Add staff, we're going to consider done. Structure change. All right. 
<clears throat> we believe this is necessary um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, we, the, the larger we've gotten, the more complex our ministries have become to where there becomes quite a steep learning curve with them, right? The things that it takes to know and be up on everything that uh, the evangelism team does or the board of education or the youth is quite steep. And we believe it's a serious challenge to us to be required to replace them every two years, right? And the truth of the matter is also this, that, that the more we're asking of them, the more the skills become specific, right? In essence, at our size church, the people we're asking to go be on those boards are people who would be a good manager at their job. And if you've ever worked in, in a place, not everybody has, has gifts to manage, right? And, and, and plan and, and do those sorts of things. So we, we, we desperately want to recruit people to do this, but it is becoming really, really difficult when we have to continually replace them, right? So we're wondering about, is a, a, a structure change, will that help us with this? Um, another example is that as we move away from uh, the idea of a council and boards that approve things to do things, um, it becomes um, a bigger job. Um, the example I'm going to use is of uh, Jim. So when Jim came on to the board of evangelism, he sat down and he said, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention when you asked me this, and I agreed. Um, <laughs> that's close to it, isn't it, right? So, so what do we do now? And I said, well, since I've been at Summit, and even before Pastor retired, and I went around visiting people, talking to them, I asked them continually what they thought, what was the number one area Summit needed to grow, and they said outreach. And I said, that's what I think we need to address. And we talked about the, the verse from Acts that says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, to Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I said, what I'd like to see is the Board of Evangelism lead us to where we do a community event, a city or state event, and a national event every year. Right? Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. And Jim said, okay. And uh, Lori was on there at the time. She had a great passion for it. They started researching in particular, because we were doing the first two quite a bit, to be honest, right? The, the city and the, uh, our community. And they started researching and uh, trying to find international missions. And we, you know, connected with Cambodia. We started running with that. To get that launched as a ministry of some, it took tons of my time, right? But guess how much it takes now? Not near as much, because Jim is committed. He believed in it, had the vision, fell in love with it, and he agreed, even when he went off the board of evangelism, to have a lifetime sentence, I mean, <laughs> position, right, of, of organizing our international mission trips. At the moment, that's Cambodia. Down the road, that might be something else. But that's a perfect example of where he um, uh, spends, he leads that, right? That's under his, his leadership now. And it's, as our church grows, it requires more and more ability to do that. And our current structure really kind of makes it so that, you know, we're, it's unclear whether or not should, a, you know, um, should that person be elected? Can they be appointed? The other example I'll use of this is with Sarah. Um, she's just stepping down because she is having another baby. He's trying to, trying to make the example I was talking about earlier of the big family and the, yeah. yeah. Um, but when I recruited her and I talked to her about it, she, uh, I firmly believe this. I believe that if we ask volunteers to have high responsibility, and that's a high responsibility job, correct? Then you should have with it high authority and accountability. And so I basically said to her, you are the director of senior youth now. You decide how the ministry goes. You work with the, you know, the youth board, right? To, to get things funded and, and find direction. But the, the board, a group of people, doesn't run the ministry anymore, right? I want you to run it, right? And I think we'd agree that the, I mean, it's, she's been a tremendous blessing to us, right, in doing it that way. Some of you might argue that that's, I don't know if that falls within our structure. Um, but I didn't admit that. Turn off the recorder. Um, Next one, awesome assimilation and communication. Uh, hopefully you've begun to notice this. We have begun a really, really formal form of assimilation. Uh, now, Pastor Allshouse had one that when he first told me about it, I, 
<laughs> my jaw hit the ground, and I'm like, I don't know how that's even possible. But he used to meet with every family individually, right? And he would sometimes he'd go to their house for breakfast. I think maybe he just wanted a free meal. I don't know. But, um, he would, whenever they could, right, as they were coming in the family, he would orient them, right, um, uh, individually, right, which, which is, is fantastic. I, but if, if, if growth is really fast, I don't think that's sustainable, right? Um, we had 24 people join us last time, right? The, we'd only be through about uh, two of them, <laughs> right, at this point. So we, we've developed a different way of assimilating our people. We ask uh, if you're new to the faith or come from a different background to do our new member class as usual. But now we include what's called our SOP 101. We stole that name. But that's two Sundays where even our transfers are asked to go through it. And they spend the entire time learning about the history of Summit of Peace, um, what our values are, what we're doing, where we're going, all those sorts of things. Um, they are uh, given a spiritual gift inventory to help discover whether their gifts are, how they can contribute to Summit, what their expectations um, of us can be, and what our expectations of, of them are, right? And then, as I mentioned, as soon as that ends, what starts? Small groups, all right, so that they can... They can become part of us. And then the communication, uh, hopefully you've, you've seen that we've tried to increase that, obviously, particularly in our day and age through lots of more technology. We have more and more things um, uh, going on, and I, we have no way to track this, so I can't say one way or the other what, what to say about it. We had um, about 130 more in, uh, for our Christmas Eve services than we've ever had and about 170 more for Easter than we've ever had. And there's only one thing we did different. Do you want to know what it is? Facebook. We did Facebook ads for quite a while leading up into both of those. Now, we don't have a way to, I guess we could track them all down and go, why did you come here? But that's just an example. Um, our communication about the needs of people, their prayers, all that sort of stuff, um, uh, hopefully you've seen that as well. And this is deliberate on our part because we recognize the more we grow, the more that's going on, the harder it is for everybody to know. All right. Here's the most difficult of all. Leadership style. When we think about a church and we think about its, uh, p the idea that people have a natural preference for a church, this in particular applies to their pastor. They either um, come from a context or currently have one in which their expectations of what the pastor does and does not do is very, very clear in their minds. Right? But I had a, the, a district president say this to me. He was one of them that I interviewed. He said it very clearly. He said, the number one barrier to churches, right, getting through the plateaus they have is, one, the pastor's inability to change how he pastors, and two, a church's inability to let him. And what I mean by that is this. According to the Bible and the Lutheran Confessions, there are only two things that Pastor Roberts and I can do that the rest of you should not accept in the case of an emergency. What are those two things? Uh, baptism, yes. Sacraments, let's say the sacraments. Baptism and the Lord's Supper and publicly proclaim the word of God for the church. Right? Those are the only two things. Everything else in our, in our, our call documents, in our uh, vows, ordination vows, are to direct the ministry of whatever, teaching, admonishing, visiting sick, that sort of stuff. But those are the only two things that we have and must to do. Must do. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that the more the church grows, um, uh, the more it is necessary for Pastor and I to be the ones that lead a new ministry, Right? Uh, a thing like the community garden, piece of pizza, Cambodia, any new ministry that we start requires our, our effort to get it going. Not usually to keep it going, but to get it going. And I believe at our size, if Pastor Roberts and I made all hospital shut-in visits, uh, did visitation like Pastor All's House did in terms of families, did all the delinquent calls, oops, I wasn't going to use that word, calls on people who haven't come in a while, if we did that, it is not an exaggeration to say to you, that is all we would do. That's how, that's how big we are. So um, what it takes for a change in leadership style is for both a pastor and its people to be able to um, begin to think about things differently. Um, I think of the, the friendliness of, of Summit of Peace. I go back to that. I had a member of Gethsemane. Oh, I probably should. 
some person from some church visited me <laughs> last year and uh, was in my office, and they were ready to start coming here. And I said, well, tell me what happened. He said, well, I was sick at this such and such a time, and, uh, you know, the pastor called me, but he never, never came to visit. I was like, oh, that's terrible. He says, yeah, nobody, nobody came to visit me. I'm like, nobody came to see you? He goes, oh, well, and he named 12 different families that came to see him. And I was like, I thought he said nobody came. He said, well, the pastor didn't come to see him. And I was like, whoa, whoa. So you're part of a community of faith that loves you so much that there's 12 people who took time out of their day, out of their job, came to see you, to share with you the love of Christ, and you're mad because the paid guy didn't do it but sent them. He didn't join, needless, <laughs> needless to say. So I want you to think about this in a, a couple of different ways. I would suggest to you that, um, that pastors are always the choke point uh, in ministry, right? We, we are the ones through whom uh, everything seems to flow, and I firmly believe that Summit of Peace isn't going to do better at closing this gap unless we change some of our expectations and behaviors in this way, right? And so it'll mean things like this. It'll mean that, uh, you know, Pastor and I will always be the ones who come in an emergency, right? You've, something terrible's happened. And, and even for the most part, if you have a planned surgery that you, that you tell us about. But what it might mean down the road is then that our Stevens ministers and our elders are the ones that see you the day after, the week after, that sort of thing, right? Um, it, it also means, for example, um, I've never kind of publicly explained this, so now's a good chance. Uh, a lot of people are unhappy that Thursday night Bible study has ended, right, that we, that we don't do that anymore. But it was our determination as pastors and elders to, to look at it this way. Uh, and I loved teaching that class. It was one of my absolute favorite. But I reached a point where it sort of dawned on me. That class had been going on for 20-plus years with people who had learned the Bible astoundingly well. And the best thing we should have done is to have them then do what? Teach a study. We had 20 or 25 people continuing to go when we could have had 25 more Bible studies, Right? So that's what we're trying to do with our, our small group and the reason that we're training leaders and, and, and we're trying to expand that. We believe if the expectation is, is that everything has to run through us, then we're maxed out. This is all summit will ever be. And to be honest, I don't believe that Pastor and I um, have the same kind of gifts that Pastor Allshouse did to do that kind of visitation, that kind of thing, right? In fact, um, I would suggest to you Oh, well, let me finish saying, hey, I consider our facilities to be done. We don't need to worry about that for a while. Um, so the last, last thing I would say is this. I believe with all of my heart that God sent to someone of peace the perfect pastor in Pastor All's house when they did to lead them through that incredible growth. I believe that with all my heart. And I equally believe that God has called and sent both of us to you at this time to lead you to the next one. But, and I can't say this strongly enough, it will not happen by us being exactly like Pastor All's house. And so our, our purpose in this is to give you the broader picture of this so that you understand um, things like, I'll give you an example, um, uh, we, at the moment, handle our hospital calls based on who's preaching, right? So if you're preaching, you tend not to do the hospital calls unless you're in the middle of a wedding, and then I still have to go do the hospital call. No, just kidding. Um, but we, we've had it where people have called me and said, Pastor, such and such going on, and I, I'll say either, uh, can you call Pastor Roberts? Um, one time they called me while I was running, and I said, can you call Pastor Roberts and let them know, right? Because he was on call. He was the one want to do that. And that's, that's hard for some people, and I, and I recognize it. Um, but the truth of the matter is, this is what we believe is necessary to best serve the church as a whole to go to the next stage. Now, Gordy, you asked me about other options. Have you, are you familiar with the concept of poisoning the well in an argument? It basically means, okay, <laughs> I'm going to give you five options that are so, four other options that are so terrible that you'll have to pick mine. 
I'm kidding halfway about that. Number one, we could do nothing. We could, we could stay the course. Um, and I, I hope you understand and believe me when I say I do understand the, the basic human nature to believe that what um, produced a certain amount of, of, of success and growth in a church will do it again. But I think if anything is, has been shown, as I mentioned earlier, nobody, nobody on the planet, I, if there was a Guinness Book of World Record for a visitation pastor, Pastor Allis House would have it. And yet despite that, it didn't keep that gap in terms of num- members and participation from getting ever larger. Because even the greatest only has so much bandwidth. Does that make sense? And so, Gordy, I suggest to you that one option is to do nothing but that is a terrible option. Number two, hire more staff, especially clergy. Uh, we have uh, 700-ish in members, so if we follow the, the formula, we need about four or so, so we need to get two more. I can't even keep the one I've got under control, so there's no, <laughs> I don't like. <clears throat> So I don't like that one. <laughs> this next one, in all seriousness, could be a possibility. What we could do is we could say, well, the problem is we're so big, what if we were two or three small churches again? We could plant churches. We could become two or three. My opinion is this. Um, I love planting churches. I think it's one of the greatest things. But I don't think we would be in the place to do it until we've, in essence, built out this campus. Does that make sense? So in other words, once we've, we've maxed our, our land and everything and, and been everything we can here, then we should plant a church. But that's just me. You could convince me, let's go plant two or three other churches. That would be an option. Um, the legalistic method is what I'm going to call it. There are churches, I know of one in particular, I believe it's in Michigan, where in order to address this, what they decided was, you must be in worship, in their church, 75% of the time in the year, or you're automatically dropped. There's no, there's no letter cycle. There's no holding your hand. There's, it's all on you. You're supposed to be the Christian who knows what you're supposed to do. You want to be part of the church? Then show up. And if you don't, you're not. That would probably make our numbers and manageable. I agree. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't like that one either. Because... Because, uh, yeah, well, there's lots of reasons I don't like that one. So, the last one is, guess what? That we have to change. That we need to recognize, re- embrace, rejoice in the absolute astounding work of God's faithful pastors and people here over the years. But also to recognize and admit that it takes different people, different leadership, different times and different seasons. And that if we're going to do, if we're going to close that gap, if we're going to be all that we can in this community, we're going to need your, your help, your buy-in. So if you were paying attention, there's two things that, in essence, well, you could say three. We're going to ask your opinion on the worship. But there are two things that we need from you. One is formal as one is informal. One is the structure. We are and have been investigating uh, a structure change here at Summit of Peace. And the truth of the matter is those 13 churches I interviewed, they didn't all do the same structure change. There's no, there's no guarantee in, in, in that. But we've been investigating this and um, have reached a point where we think this is worth pursuing. So sometime in the near future, we believe we're going to ask you to uh, give us the blessing to bring in a consultant to lead us through a structure change. Um, I will say the, the pastors that I talked to of those 13, nine of them tried it themselves and eventually gave up and hired a consultant, and the rest hired a consultant from the beginning. And none of them that I asked were able to lead it themselves. It, just, it was just too much. So you will, down the road, um, hear from us, I would say sooner than later, uh, a request to come and have someone present to us a structure change. And what that would look like is they would come out, they would do something like this, an all-day thing, however long it took, to answer all your questions about, about how it would work and what it would take. We'll be asking for that. The two, the second one is not one that you can, there's no vote on, but it's the leadership style acceptance, right? It's the, the ability for you to uh, allow us to lead differently. Um, to be honest, if we're not doing it, because I will say this, 
if, I'll pick on Gethsemane again, if that man had not been visited by all those families, whose fault would it have been? It's still the pastor's. Just because he doesn't see him doesn't mean it's not his responsibility. So if our people are not cared for correctly, even if it's not by me, that is still on me, right? And, I, and, I, and we will both take that very seriously. But what we're asking of you is to begin to let us um, uh, lead you in a different way, serve you in a different way. And that's going to mean things like elders might be the ones who follow up on you with um, delinquent um, uh, hospital, things like that, especially our Stevens ministry. We think this is a huge, huge part and answer to what we need to do uh, to be able to serve God's people is the, is the Stevens ministry as well. But, but you're, it, you recognize, I think, that it's going to take a little acceptance on your part, right? That a, there's going to be a different person that's seeing you, and he doesn't have a funny collar on, and he's not as funny as I am, and, or whatever. Does that make sense? All right. I thank you so much for your attention.